G'day everyone, I'm Ebony Bennett, I'm Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to our Pole Position webinar series, where every fortnight we give you the scoop on the latest results of the Guardian Essential Poll. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I did want to thank you all uh, for joining us at a different time uh, and day. Last time uh, you, you joined us after the Easter long weekend. Uh, we're back to usual time and date, but we do have a special guest today, Sarah Martin, Chief Political Correspondent at Guardian Australia. She's filling in for our regular panellist, uh, Murphy Roo, Catherine Murphy, who is on the campaign trail at the moment. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Canberra is Ngunnawal country and pay my respects to elders past and present. Sovereignty was never ceded and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And just a note that, you know, that's still very much unresolved business and uh, the Uluru Statement from the Heart remains uh, out there as an unresolved question this election with the Prime Minister effectively ruling it out. So a long way to go still on that campaign um, to support sovereignty. Uh, I do want to say and remind everyone that our times for webinars and days do vary. So head on over to australiainstitute.org.au to find all the latest details for those. Um, this Friday, we'll be talking to uh, Chris Bowen, the Shadow Minister for Climate Change. We're attempting to put on a climate debate on Friday. So hopefully you can tune in for that. It should be up on our website. And just a reminder, uh, for Zoom tips uh, to make sure this all goes nice and smoothly. You can type in questions for our panel using the Q&A box and you can also upvote other people's questions as well. A reminder to please keep things civil and on topic in the chat or we'll have to boot you out. And uh, lastly, a reminder that this discussion is being recorded. The video will go up on australiainstitute.tv later today and the audio will go up as an episode of Guardian's Australian Politics podcast tomorrow morning. For those listening from the podcast, you can see all the results that we'll be discussing today at essentialreport.com.au. Uh, and before we kind of get stuck in, you know, to give you a bit of a wrap, we're over halfway through the election campaign now. The coalition has had, you know, not a great couple of weeks with the nationals looking like they're trying to renege on the net zero by 2050 commitment more internal problems with hand-picked candidates like Catherine Deves in Warringah, a potential interest rate rise later today when the Reserve Bank meets, putting cost of living um, firmly at the top of the political agenda. While on the other side of things, opposition leader Anthony Albanese is back on the campaign trail after a week in isolation. Uh, he launched Labor's campaign on Sunday, uh, but as we might see, his isolation wasn't necessarily harmful to, uh, to Labor's campaign. Um, today, there's a bit more news around uh, with a sitting ICAT commissioner, one of three effectively calling the Prime Minister a buffoon for describing it, uh, the ICAC, as a kangaroo court. And of course, we've got today's Guardian Essential Poll, which shows that Labor maintains a lead as both the major parties essentially are really struggling to reach disengaged voters. So to unpack those results and the last fortnight in politics, I'm delighted to introduce again, uh, Sarah Martin. Thanks so much for joining us, Sarah. Thanks for having me. And Pete Lewis, our regular panelist. Thanks, Pete. Hey guys. Um, Sarah, I wanna come to you first. Um, you know, a week is a long time in politics and it's been a fortnight since the last poll position. Uh, as I mentioned, we've had, you know, Albo in ISO um, and, you know, a, a few shenanigans internally for the Liberal Party. Mm. What are some of the things that stand out to you from the last two weeks? Um, well, I think we've definitely seen that um, the coalition and Scott Morrison in particular has been on the defensive. Of course, we had the issue over the Solomon Islands uh, uh, the agreement with China. Um, we've had divisions within the Lib Liberals and Nationals over the next zero target, whether or not there's wriggle room for that um, or not. Um, and then, of course, we've had inflation figures come out, which show um, that the cost of living is going up and a lot more than uh, the budget papers forecast. So on all of those issues, even though, um, you know, I guess the conventional wisdom is the coalition wants to be talking about the economy and national security um, over the past week, uh, the government has really been on the on the back foot on those two issues. Um, and I think, I mean, the interesting thing about Albanese being in isolation is one of the 
things, one of the positive things it has done for Labor is it has allowed them to really show other members of their team. And I think um, Jason Clare has been, you know, standing out as a star performer for them. And he's, of course, campaign spokesman. And um, we've had Jim Chalmers uh, take a more prominent role um, along with people like Katie Gallagher. So I think that's been... I think that's been sort of a, a positive um, for, for the Labor brand, if not necessarily directly for Albanese. Um, but, you know, I think, I don't think it, well, the polls show, I guess, that um, him being in, in isolation hasn't really been too problematic um, for their polling numbers. Yeah. Um, Pete, I did want to come to you on the polling numbers overall and really put, we're going to dive deep into, obviously, the Guardian Essential results today. But um, I think Sarah's, you know, hit on a, a, a big thing there. You know, it's in a wider context. We're still seeing probably a lot of undecided voters. We've got the teal independence as another kind of a, a bit of a, a wild card there. Can you just talk to us? Because I know a lot of people were... Um, you know, uh, felt the, the polls last time around uh, really um, didn't do the job. And I know that's something that the whole industry kind of looked at. But just talk to us about that undecided vote, what the other polls are showing at the moment, and, and give that the, the context to the election before we dive into the details. Yeah, thanks, Yep. Um, it's actually been interesting. As a result, I think, of the unanimity of the polling miss in 2019, the polls have actually, the different pulses have actually come up with different ways of, of thinking through the challenge of providing um, a lodestar for the election and not, and critically not predicting results. I want to push back whenever anyone says a poll predicts a result, all it does is say where we are now. So we at the Guardian Essential Report um, made the call that we were going to start placing undecideds in our sample. So our number today is 49.45 with six undecided. Now, if you took those off, you'd have the impression one sided past 50%. So they were like winning, which we just don't think is a healthy way of looking at it. So we've basically got 6% of the electorate who are undeclared and another significant number, as I'll show you later, who's saying they could well change their vote. Um, so we've kept, our big change is we've kept the undecideds in. Um, the new poll that nine Fairfax puts out resolve goes the absolute opposite way and doesn't let you say don't know and their theory is that they're trying to replicate what happens when you're actually in the ballot box where don't know isn't an option my beef with that is I think that's pumping up independence because I suspect independent becomes a default landing point if you don't know mm. um, although we, time will only tell and I don't want to diminish the the, the, the obvious rise in support for independence, particularly in those key seats. News poll is still doing the traditional formulation. Um, so we've actually not just got different polls um, with slightly different results this time, and there is differences in the numbers. We've also got different methodologies underlying it, and I think that's healthy. Um, it, yeah. does, it just means that there is more friction around the scoreboard and I'm not trying to do myself out of a job I just don't want my stuff to be used in the wrong way so I hope that answers the question but we're happy to go go deeper in the other thing I'll say is that you know getting samples is is difficult work um, we work through data broking agencies to get panels that reach um, an ABS weighted um, sample that that is statistically valid so the right gender split the right geography split um, income splits um, and so there's lots of different moving parts that you're trying to pull together to get a fair representation. Mm. Um, well we might dig into the actual uh, slides now um, so going from the beginning. There's no elegant yeah. way to do it is there? No unfortunately I haven't <laughs> discovered a clean way of getting up the slides I'm afraid um, but kicking us off with this um, a like overall number, as you said, with the 6% undecided in the middle. Is there any change there from last fortnight? There's a little bit of a change around the edges. Um, the, the other thing I should say for people listening on the Guardian podcast from home, um, you can go to essentialreport.com.au to look at these numbers. We'll show you the trends in a sec. So the baseline, as we said before, 49, 45, 6 percent undecided. You guys can do your um, equations. You can you can work out what that would mean in the old style, but I'm not even going to grace it with language. 
Um, Labor's primary vote steady um, over the last fortnight. Coalition drops a, a point. As we say every time, a point means nothing. Long-term trend lines mean something. 3% margin of error. So when you look at those lines, you should be looking at a line that goes that is fatter than the single point line moving across the screen. And if you go to the the the, bit, the only shift really was on that two party preferred, and I think that was because of the a, a, a minor shift in in different preferences. So last week it was forty seven forty six, um, with seven percent don't know. This week it's forty nine forty five with six percent don't know. Big picture that says that Labor has got a very solid base of people that are intending to vote for them. The coalition needs to either take some of the people that are saying they'll vote Labor and move them across the coalition column or convince those last 6% that haven't made a call yet. That's what the last week in the election is, or the last two or three weeks in the election will be all about. It's talking to uncommitted or non-committed voters who tend to be lower information um, who tend to look at politics out of the corner of their eye, which is why it's not just the substance of the debates, but the images that come out of the daily news um, conferences that are going to be critical. It is also where I do think external events may have an impact. And we'll deep in, dig in deeper a little bit to the cost of living bogey that's sitting there for the coalition in a moment. But I do think what happens, I think it's at two o'clock, Sarah, the um, Reserve Bank comes out with its fund at 2.30. Yeah. I think that will be significant. Um, the other two that we've been running the last few weeks, and I don't want to spend everyone's time on, on, on graphs, but the, the two markers that are not voting intention that have always been useful for pollsters in getting a sense of the mood, deserves to be re-elected or time to give someone else a go. Um, 48, 33, we think it's time to give someone else a go, but still 21% undecided. If you click to the next one, um, Ed, we've broken that down between people who also, between people who say their vote is definitely locked in and those that are softer, unsurprising, the softer voters are much more likely not to have formed a view yet. But you can see there that really the locked in vote at 50% of firm voters re ready to give someone else a go. And sorry, I'll just correct you, Pete. I think you said 48, 33 uh, for views towards re-electing the federal coalition. I think it's 46, 43 this week with 21 undecided for those playing along at home. I, uh, I apologise. If <laughs> only I was good at numbers. Um, but the other one, the one that is interesting this week where there's been movement, if we go one more slide, because the, the other companion piece that is Direction of Australia, right track, wrong track, um, that had actually opened up two weeks or in April to be a significant 46-37 um, split on Australia on the right track, which was starting to make me feel a bit of a caution that people not, might not be ready to change. Over the past month, that has shifted significantly. So a 5% drop in right track, a 6% increase in wrong track. So now in net terms, it's still 16% undecided people are saying both that it's time to give someone else a go and a majority of people think Australia's on the wrong track. I suspect that's a, um, a direct call and response to the cost of living issues that we're seeing at the moment. And again, if you go to, oh, we didn't go. One more slide okay. would have shown the, break, the voter breakdown, but it's not essential. Let's just go deeper. Um, I did want to come to cost of living, Sarah. Uh, as mm. Pete said, we're going to have that potential interest rate rise this afternoon at 2.30, although it might not happen, um, but a lot of commentators are suspecting there, there will be a rate rise. But certainly cost of living has been huge during this election campaign. And I feel like at the Labor launch on the weekend, we saw um, a real focus on addressing that in quite systemic ways. Um, how do you think that's playing out in the election at the moment or this week, I guess? Um, yeah, look, it's it's interesting. I think Labor obviously has an answer to what it's going to do about cost of living pressures. It is um, putting forward policies on childcare, uh, energy, um, skills and so on. And housing obviously is, was the big one at the launch on Sunday. Um, I think in terms of the government, obviously they had their cost of living measures in the budget, but they're all very uh, short term. Um, and so that has a sort of opened them up to criticism that the, the assistance that they're providing is limited and will leave 
leave people sort of high and dry later in the year once that um, that relief winds up. Um, and I and I think certainly the government is uh, you know they're trying to argue that um, a change of government would um, would would uh, mean more risk for the economy um, and are suggesting that uh, and a Labor government like obviously one of their key attack lines is life won't be easy under Albanese um, but there's not really any um, you'll be shocked to learn that there's not a lot of substance to that that's just a scare and sort of um, I guess uh, what's the word I want like just sort of preying on people's um, uh, uh, vulnerability and uncertainty about the times ahead and the risk of change I think um, whoever's in government, we're in line for rate rises. So, I mean, a lot of the stuff that we're hearing today from both leaders is um, is just, just politics um, because really uh, rate rises are going up, whoever's in power. And, um, you know, Morrison has said that, uh, you know, he, he's sort of trying to argue both sides of the fence. He's sort of saying, um, you know, in, the Reserve Bank is independent. Um, that you know what we don't have any control over what they do but if, an, if a Labor government got in that would impact how um, you know how the Reserve Bank might uh, respond to economic challenges suggesting that uh, obviously economic management does play a role in monetary policy so um, I think I think it's I think it's a tricky one and obviously Labor's not going too hard on um, the government for uh, the potential for interest rate rises because they know if they are in government and we have a series of interest rate rises over the next 12 months or over the next term of um, of parliament then you know they go they are going to uh, potentially cop the heat for that as well so um, they're both sort of trying to dance a, a delicate line on this um, but yeah look I, I think cost of living what was really interesting in, in today's poll is that people see that labor is best placed to or the, are most trusted to handle those cost of living pressures um, not the government and I think it's just a general rule that if people are um, unhappy about their conditions um, then naturally they look to the government of the day um, to for that um, and and ask them to take some responsibility and say to the government what are you doing to make my life easier and when people's lives are, uh, when they're feeling the pinch um, they're going to potentially take that out on the government of the day yeah um, well diving back into those issues perhaps let's see if this works oh yes back to where we were that's exciting um, uh, we've got the direction of Australia, Pete, by voting. Oh, yeah, that was just the, the, the um, you know, the sub-tab on what we were talking about before. But, again, um, wrong track. There's still 41 of soft voters with 21% unsure. So I think, you know, that is part of the final little play in this election. Um, yeah. Then we get into some issues questions here. The first one is on yeah. climate change, and then I think we've got cost of living up next. Yeah, this has been a wild old ride that we've been sort of charting for over a decade. I've only gone back as far as August 2016, but as you can see, um, you know, in a week where the National Party was um, walking away from the um, heroically modest um, ambitions of the Prime Minister on climate, the, um, the number of people believing the government's not doing enough was rising again it's not a historic highs um, of the bushfires in January 2020 when it was 62 percent but it's um, back up close to 50 percent um, then you get a bunch of issues that we've looked at now um, for those again on the podcast you'll have to go into essentialreport.com.au and if you're at home you're probably going to have to squint but we <laughs> put a bunch what we're doing here is a test of both salience and trust so the first slide is a salience slide and we ask people to rate on a scale of one to ten how important various issues are 47 percent of people are saying cost of living is a 10 um, and Provision of public services is second at 37% of people giving that a 10. Job security, 28. Climate change, 29%. Relationship with China and the Solomon Islands, 22%. Reducing government debt, 19%. Boat turnbacks, 18%. And that lovely little debate about transgenders in sport, 10%, giving that a number 10. Now, that... It, it, it flows through and it's almost an inverse on those that think it's not important at all. So if you're looking at that on the screen, you can see that it, it gives you a, a really nice marker of the importance of the various issues being discussed. But if you go to the next slide, Ebony, then it is so on those issues, and we've done in the same order, 
which party do you trust to manage the following issues? And as we can see, and again, we looked at this the other week, but it's extended, 40, 30 labour on cost of living with 30 no difference. So that was the number one issue. Likewise, on improving public services, 44, 26 labour. Job security, 38, 29 labour. Climate change, 40, 21. And it is only when you get to some of those issues that I guess... Um, you might argue as being more performative that the coalition gets back in the game. But even the transgender issue, those that um, on that issue, people would rather labour managing it, which means not trying to pump it up for cheap laughs and outrage um, rather than the coalition. Mm -hmm. um, so what does that say to me? It says that if this election is an issues election, election labour is well positioned. And then all you're left with is the leadership election. Um, where you've got the better the devil you know um, versus the guy you still don't quite know. But here again, the majority of people say they want to vote on the issues, not the leader. Yeah, so um, just for people playing along at home, they essential asked um, what was more important, um, party policies or party leaders, and two-thirds say a political party that has better policies for Australia compared to 20% um, who say a political party that has a leader who would make a better PM. Um, so, Pete, as you were saying, um, uh, you know, there's a clear preference there. <laughs> yeah. So um, wrapping all this together, I'll drop in chat in a sec the piece I've put up in Guardian today around the whole idea that Morrison is running um, basically on um, the better the devil you know. My thesis is there isn't a lot of sympathy for the devil at the moment. Um, at, look, on one level, running on better the devil you know must be incredibly liberating because you no longer need to defend your performance in any way because all you're saying is, yeah, yeah, I get it. I'm transactional. No one trusts me. I don't support a corruption um, inquiry. But look at the other guy. The problem is at the moment, that is all premised on the idea that the other guy is scary. And I actually did a bit of research, or as other people call it, Googling on the um, the history of the, the phrase, the better the devil you know. And apparently it's attributed back to Edward the Bruce, who was the lesser known brother of Robert the Bruce, who was a Scot, another Scot. And he was a Scotsman that um, worked his magic around Ireland in the 14th century raising villages to the ground on the basis that you'd rather I do it than have the um, English come in um, and do it to you because they're worse than me. Um, now, it seems to me, and the, the, the other point in that little um, story was that, that the whole adage is not just, it's not just the better the devil you know. The, the, the full quote is that, you know, you'd rather have a known bad thing happen to you than something unknown. And I guess the unknown bit is what they've been banking on. And yeah. Labor's small target strategy up until now, and I think the launch has mean that it's no longer a small strategy, has, has left that doubt. But if we go all the way back to the 14th century, you'd rather have someone who you absolutely dislike than someone you don't know. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the coalition's election strategy laid bare um, um i can say or can i just can i just pipe up here peter because i think the, your thesis um it doesn't <laughs> neglects to mention like this is why the independents are doing so well because it's neither the devil you know or the devil you don't know it's like the third option it's like mm. the i don't know where that's that's why they're doing so well because you, when you're out in the field and you talk to voters they say like they've got this very, like, very mm. firm view that they're both as bad as each other when they're looking at the major parties. And I just feel like this is such a phenomenon. And you know, mm. if we want an explanation for that, look at the negative campaigning that's going on between the two majors. Like people hate it. Um, and it's been going on for such a long time that they've just gradually eroded their standing within the community. And so as far as the voters are concerned, they're all devils. And hey, look at that independent over there. That's that's interesting. It, it's really yeah. true. There's an adage of political research that voters tell you they hate um, negative advertising, but it works. Mm. What if they were actually right? What mm. if they actually do hate negative advertising? Um, but, um, you know, even, you know, the way that the, um, I've been interested in the way that the Liberals have been attacking the Teals. They've just been saying, again, 
no, they're the devil too. They're the Greens. Mm -hmm. They're they're actually, they're they're fake. They're they're fakes. They're not a real independent. And Mm -hmm. it does sort of feed into that pox on both your houses, which is a different lineage, obviously, and goes back to the point. (laughs) Um, Well, speaking of the teal independent candidates, the Australia Institute today released um, some polling in the state of Goldstein, uh, which is Tim Wilson's seat. And that polling shows... um, that he's really under serious pressure uh, from Zoe Daniel, the independent running there. Um, I believe she was on Radio National th- this morning if people wanted to listen to that. But yeah, basically showing neck and neck on primaries. And um, and even if you take a very conservative kind of two-party preferred, um, Tim Wilson looking like he's, he's in trouble there. Obviously, seat polls... Um, you know, are a little bit of a different beast to a national poll, but, you know, it's certainly an indication that the coalition should be worried in those seats. I think those results are up on the Australia Institute website if anyone wants to to check them out. But I was curious, Sarah, um, you know, a lot of the, particularly the teal independent candidates, and I think a few of the rural independent candidates as Mm -hmm. well, um, as well as minor parties where a lot of um, people uh, see them as an alternative as well. Integrity seems to be a huge issue along with climate. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we saw the New South Wales, uh, one of the commissioners for ICAC there, really hitting back against the idea that the New South Wales ICAC is a kangaroo court, effectively labelling the Prime Minister a buffoon for saying so, but also highlighting the danger of undermining, um, you know, integrity commissions. I'm just curious what you think about the politics of that, because obviously the Mm. Prime Minister is kind of, you know, trying to discredit them because it doesn't want to run a federal, you know, it's backed away from um, implementing an integrity commission federally, but it's such a huge issue in those Mm. inner city safe liberal seats. How do you Mm. see the politics of that playing out? It's really fascinating because you'd, you'd be forgiven for thinking that um, Scott Morrison was all but abandoning those inner city liberal members because on climate and on and on integrity, um, even on the amount of money that's been promised to those electorates, they've really vacated the field. And I think they've kind of decided that they'll just let those um, moderate liberal MPs run their own race. Obviously, Scott Morrison's physical presence um, doesn't help them because the anger directed towards him is white hot but it's pretty extraordinary that given the promise on the integrity commission before the last election and given the you know given internally those moderate MPs were saying we need to deliver this or I'm going to be in strife in my seat um, and that message was delivered in you know completely crystal in a completely crystal clear manner um, to the Prime Minister and the Attorney General Michaelia Cash um, there was time to do something um, now obviously the feelings within the uh, around the, the coalition cabinet table are so strong on this that they were uh, unprepared to consider um, not even like introducing the legislation and and debating amendments. I mean, they just they didn't even introduce the bill. Like they tabled the um, the, the the exposure draft, um, but they didn't. They weren't even prepared to sit down and have the debate. And that was sort of. Uh, much to the frustration of not just some of those um, MPs who are under threat, but uh, the moderate um, Liberal MPs in those seats un- uh, under threat, but people like Bridget Archer in Bass, uh, people like the outgoing MP for Bennelong, John Alexander, um, Celia Hammond over in um, WA. Um, she's also uh, facing a challenge, but um, you know, this was a, this was an issue of great concern to those MPs. So it's sort of, I find it staggering that that was a election commitment that um, Morrison was prepared to, to break. Um, and, you know, if it come, it really does come back to bite them and potentially loses them government if we do get a handful of those independents. Uh, well, one, it'll be up for negotiation. Um, so I think we, we, that's, that's been made clear but by those teal independents that an integrity commission would be one of their non-negotiables as they negotiate. Like if we're talking a hung parliament situation, that, that's something they would be, they would be demanding. Um, so, you know, I think, I think if, uh, if the government really does... Uh, suffer and lose um, a handful of those teal seats um, then it, the consequences of that are super interesting because there's sort of you know a realignment underway um, now I think if the coalition loses those seats but then doesn't pick up seats in the outer suburbs and metro areas where they're hoping to you know, like um, to try and offset those losses um, then you know there's no what happens to the Liberal Party then they've kind of lost lost their um, you know centrist uh, you know, economic voters, 
um, and they haven't picked up the working class voters they think they can they can win over um, you know to try and to try and balance that out so um, you know it, it will change the shape the the nature and um, character of the coalition party room if Josh Frydenberg loses his seat then yeah. we're pretty much guaranteed Peter Dutton as leader um, and you know even if Josh uh, uh, keeps his seat and the numbers in the party room change to the extent that there's that there's a much more conservative bent, then we still may end up with Peter Dutton as opposition leader. So you know, I think it's going to be really fascinating to see how that plays out. And I do get the sense that despite in previous elections, um, there's obviously always been talk about uh, independents picking up some of these seats. There is a real, uh, uh, there is real momentum for those candidates this time round in a way that I don't think we've seen previously. Even though arguably, climate change is not as heated a political issue as it has been in the past. And I know, um, you know, someone on the Morrison campaign was saying, oh, well, you know, the last election we were followed everywhere by climate protesters and we're not getting that this time. So, you know, they're suggesting that some of the heat has come out of it after their net zero commitment. But not if you look at those seats. In those That's seats, misreading the yeah, signals. Completely. It's actually an incredibly disciplined campaign by the climate movement, mm. recognising the impact of their activism last time, I reckon. So that's yeah, interesting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, can I just jump one thing that I'm interested in going one deeper? So the progressive push back on the teals is if you're really successful you are going to turn the coalition into a MAGA party which at some point will have power in Australia and you're much better to have a Liberal party with a progressive wing um, so a, a Liberal party that can deliver a Prime Minister like Malcolm Turnbull rather than a Prime Minister like Peter Dutton now I'm interested in I'm interested in everyone's view on that like I if you look at the ball in front of you, you go, these candidates have a much more progressive policy agenda, but I do think there is some merit in that analysis. Yeah, perhaps some merit, but, um, you know, it was uh, a Liberal Party with plenty of moderates in it that also delivered Tony Abbott, you know, a, mm. quite a conservative PM. So, you know, what the outcomes are, I think it's worth thinking about, um, but, you know. But, but it is remarkable that. Progressives isn't a guarantee that you'll get no. it. A moderate. But it is remarkable the way that Morrison's walking away from those seats. And, mm -hmm. you know, even to Sarah's point, um, his vociferous attack on ICAC just takes a card out of any negotiation he would have mm -hmm. with the Teals if they do hold the balance of power. He's almost, he's almost, it seems like he's pushing them to say Labor's the only alternate government that I could work with. Now, that, mm. I don't know if that's a cunning plan or if it's just more stuff up rather than conspiracy, but that's going to be the end point there. Grand deal post-election. Um, I mean, sorry, go, Sarah. No, go, no, oh, no. I was just going to say it's a bit like the Catherine Deves issue as well. Like all the moderates are like, just stop talking about it. And <laughs> he's like every day was out like whacking. There's got to be a cunning plan there, but um, I can't see it. I don't know. I never assume a cunning plan where uh, incompetence could uh, <laughs> uh, be also substituted in there. I will say um, if you head on over to australiainstitute.org.au, we did also ask in the Goldstein poll um, what people think um, the independent candidates should do if they end up in the balance of power um, and interesting results there, I think, for people to check out. Certainly um, a substantial amount of backing for Scott Morrison to be PM but amongst those who are voting for Zoe Daniel, um, a lot of who are opposed essentially to that. So quite, I think, a bit of leeway there <clears throat> for independents who will be negotiating potentially around some of these issues of integrity and climate, as we mentioned. Um, I did want to come back to cost of living issues and the Labor launch. And Pete, I'm um, asking you about those issues, they are seen more as Labor's home turf. Um, I think pending whatever the outcome is with the interest rate um, uh, announcement later today, cost of living is still going to remain at the top of um, the agenda for a lot of people. Um, even though the economy is kind of seen as stronger turf for the coalition, when it's in that frame of cost of living, you've talked a lot more about how people trust Labor more. That's kind of shown in the, the polling results there. Um, you know, Sarah mentioned the focus on, on housing. There was also pay equity announcements. There was um, other issues around health and aged care and things like that. Um, how much are these issues, you know, if they're at the top of the agenda for voters playing into 
undecideds breaking for Labor in the last couple of weeks of the campaign. Yeah. I, again, I don't want to be in the prediction business, but people that have heard me before will know my theory that government changes in a wave. I think the tide's out on Morrison. I think there is a scenario and in, an interest rate rise will just sort of create the momentum that there will be, um, you know, a bit of a mood for change. And for those that are undecided, worried about cost of living, which is their number one issue disproportionately, think about this. Labor, albeit modest policy agenda, is about government doing stuff. It's about government taking shared ownership in a home for a low-income worker. Morrison putting, says government should putting be Putting government to work, I think. Yeah, is- government should be nowhere near it. It's about government um, imposing a set of rules on the aged care system. Morrison's is about letting the market work. Um and if you if 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 you look beyond the images of what the liberals are putting forward, it's it's not really policy. It's like targets based on economic modelling with no roadmap to actually get there. Whereas I think Labor has gone more granular. So if you're an undecided voter looking at it at the end of the day, and the kind of brand superiority has diminished through lived experience that the coalition just says we're the better economic manager, it actually makes you think that that could drive people away from the incumbent and, you know, break that devil, you know, and and go with the unknown because at least there are a set of propositions that you can kind of hold on to. Mm. Um, We might go to now questions from the audience. As I said, we've got about 800 people on the line with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, One of the first questions I want to come to um, might be for you, Sarah, um, and it's about uh, preferences, essentially. Greens saying that they're preferencing Labor and not preferencing the coalition. But what else do we know about how parties are allocating preferences at the moment and, and how important will that be? Yeah, so these things are obviously all being nutted out um, by the parties. Um, once the tickets are, 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 pub, are printed, um, then, you know, the negotiations are, are fast and furious. I mean, there's some really interesting things like, for example, um, Dave Sharma in his seat, um, his second preference goes to the UAP candidate um, ahead of Allegra Spender, um, uh, which is, you know, quite quite fascinating. Um, uh, we know that One Nation and UAP preferences are going to be really critical in certain seats. Um, and I know UAP is yet to declare how some of those um, uh, will flow, despite sort of Craig Kelly indicating earlier um, that they would preference against the incumbents in in all uh, in all seats. Um, so look, I mean, you know, it, it's really difficult because there's no kind of central uh, spot where you can see all the preference deals um, that sort of left to uh, either the MP or the 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 party to publish it on their website, Um, but it's not like they have to lodge them with AEC or anything like that. Um, So often there's some surprising things that you find out in the, you know, once pre-poll opens, um, but obviously we know that there's been um, negotiations between the Liberal Party and um, the UAP. We know that um, there's a deal obviously being done between the Nats and One Nation in Queensland. Uh, So a lot of these things, particularly in those close seats, um, may end up being consequential there's a lot of interest in what happens um, with Tasmania with Jackie Lambie preferences because they could be critical in deciding the outcome in seats like uh, Braddon and Bass and Lyons Um, so you know like there's a lot of a lot of uh, debate as to where the preferences make a big difference, um, because obviously with the minor parties in particular, they don't always have the resources to man uh, polling booths and hand out their how to vote tickets. Um, you know, not not everyone follows them. Uh, so I think at the last election, I think there's uh, been a bit of work that suggested perhaps Bass was one of the few seats um, where UAP preferences made a real difference. Um, but, uh, you know, this is an election unlike one we've had um, before and that we don't really know how that post-pandemic uh, sort of anti-government sentiment is going to play out and how yeah. that support for the minor parties um, and independence is going to flow through with preferences. So in some seats where Palmer might get 10%, um, uh, is he taking that? Um, is he taking those votes away from Labor in some seats, the Liberals in other seats? How do they then get, you know, 
where do they land once they've been taken away from the major parties? So I think that's a really interesting one to watch in this election, um, yeah. and particularly in those outer suburban areas of particularly Sydney and Melbourne. And just a reminder for everyone listening, obviously uh, voters are ultimately in charge of where they put their preferences and, and don't have to follow those how to votes, which is a wrinkle in all the political parties' plans, I'm sure. Um, Pete, this one is for you. It's from Jennifer Manson, who says, how much are these polls actually representative of all of Australia, given that the respondents are likely to be ABC, Guardian and Australia Institute followers? Do you just want to explain who uh... people are who answer, Pete? Yes, no, I am not just polling my friends and colleagues, I can assure you, although that's been my um, concern of ABC Vote Compass. It, it, it sort of starts with ABC listeners, and I think there is a little bit of a, a risk of a skew there. We basically go to a panel broker, um, so there's a lot of different... Um, you know, cash for opinion services that people register for and they construct a sample for us that is not based on whether you're an ABC or a Guardian listener, Jennifer. The, the, the criticism of the, um, the sampling that I think does bear some thought was um, the review of the last election and you people may have seen it in the, the media, I know it was on Media Watch last night, which is that um, lower income um, and lower education people are less likely to register to be involved in these sorts of exercises, which aren't registered to be in a political poll, it's be registered to be in a consumer panel. So it's it's general market research, but I do think we've worked really hard at, at building up and making sure that we've got income representation and that sort of thing as well. So, you know, there is another classic, um, you know, principle of, of research, which is the observer effect, that once you are actually being researched, your perspective changes as well. And there's not much you can do with that. So there's, 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 lots, of, there's lots of reasons why um, a sample won't work. Um, what always astounds me is that more often than not, it gets it pretty close. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I can assure you that we're not just... Um, we're not just researching our friends. And, and that goes the same for Australia Institute polling. We are a member of the Australian Polling Council. We use a similar, you know, panel like Pete is talking about. So it's not just going out to Australia Institute supporters or anything. Um, and we have- Oh my God, what would be the 2PP? <laughs> Um, uh, so yeah, just a reminder, we are fully transparent and disclosure, you know, uh, have disclosure obligations and people can always check that out on our website if they've got any, you know, um, uh, questions about the questions that we've asked. And similarly, you can go to essential, or what is it, Pete, sorry, essentialreport.com.au for the full results, all the questions, yeah. um, everything publicly available for you to check out. So, um, that's, I just thought was a good question given we were talking a lot about the nature of polling this week. Um, the next question I've got here is from James Bannon. Sarah, he asks, is there any evidence to suggest Labor is managing to combat the LNP position that Labor are poor economic managers or is that message too deeply entrenched? Well, I think we'll probably find out the answer to that on, on polling day. I mean, uh, I, I think they are they are combating it by basically trying to keep the focus on the government's economic management and the experience of voters over um, some time um, with lack of wage growth and so on and saying, you know, government can't lecture us about economic management when we have a you know debt approaching a trillion dollars um when we've had the largest deficits we've ever seen um when uh you know uh we've got inflation at um 20 year highs um and uh you know so on and so on so i think um they're trying to combat it by keeping the focus very firmly on the government's record i mean it's Again, it's one of those it's sort of that cultural thing that people just instinctively think that the coalition are better economic managers. But some polls, and I think including Accenture, has shown that that is not necessarily um, true anymore. So um, I don't know if it is as effective as it was, um, you know, perhaps 20 years ago. Um, maybe at, at some deep psychological level, people believe that um, in the same way that Labor, obviously their traditional strength is, is health. Um, but yeah, look, I think, I think the times are certainly different with the pandemic and with people's lived experience over the past decade um, under a coalition government. So I think it probably makes it easier for them to combat it to a certain extent. And also the fact that they haven't, Labor hasn't been in government for a while. So um, 
you know, people, if they were unhappy with you know, Labor governments in the past, um, you know, perhaps it's been a long enough time to forget about the, you know, the high interest rates under Paul Keating. It, you know, a different a different generation and perhaps a different mindset about those sorts of issues. I don't mm. know what do you think, Pete. Oh well, you know, my one of my load stars, which I've shared here previously, is the Finger Hut effect. Vic Finger Hut, legendary Washington pollster, who um, has this thesis that if you ask the question, who's better at managing the economy? Um, right of centre parties tend to split 60-40. If you shift it to who is better at managing the economy for ordinary people like yourself, it's 55-45 to um, left of leaning parties. This is around Western democracies. We've always said the challenge is to take it away from top level economic indicators into mm. things that actually matter to people. So in 2007, it was work choices and workers' rights this time cost of living is actually not an economic indicator like you've got inflation as the economic indicator but it makes it more granular and then you can start building stories out of what's granular so mm -hmm. our our numbers are clearly saying that that top level um, natural advantage in managing the economy is being challenged once you unpack it a little bit mm. and again you know the government's been trying to claim credit for a whole bunch of things outside their control including low low numbers of um, jobless given the borders have been closed and now they're about to then say it's not our fault if interest rates go up so I think they're in all sorts but it's actually not no longer I think about economic management as much as it's about the government taking responsibility for what's going on and I think mm -hmm. that's where Morrison is particularly exposed. Mm -hmm. Um, the next question I've got is from Ronald Smith, who says, Clive Palmer claims he can keep interest rates below 3%. Isn't this a bald-faced lie, as the RBA is independent of politics? Sarah, do you want to take that one? Uh, yes, is the answer to that. Um, and in fact, there's a, a good, uh, there was a good story um, published on The Guardian, which I encourage you to look up, which sort of explains why um, there is absolutely um, no way that um, he can do that. Um, but really interesting that he has chosen that issue to focus on because obviously um, the, the issue of housing and potential mortgage stress is a, 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 a sleeper issue. Um, and I think particularly if you look at some of those areas where um, mortgage stress is, is more of a risk, again, we're talking people living, living on the suburban fringes. Um, if Clive Palmer is the only party really talking about that, and that's obviously changed a bit since um, Labor's housing announcement on the weekend, um, but clearly that is going to get traction. Uh, people are worried about their mortgages, um, and I think there's, I don't know what you think about this, Peter, I don't think we've spoken about it, but I know that um, both major parties think that the research that Palmer has is really, really good in terms of like what type, what issues are really concerning to people, um, and, and which is why he's um, really campaigning very heavily on the pox on both your houses stuff and has singled out this issue of housing um, affordability and mortgage stress as one of a key concern to mm. voters so he can't do anything about it but he can certainly um, pick up some more voters by talking about it and it's great to know that he writes his own ads as well which was the revelation that really struck me this week so um yeah he's definitely driving the ship yeah the intriguing thing for me on palmer i i, I think he's put, got more resources than most of the other parties actually to do the research and the advertising this time last election it basically pivoted into a negative bill shorten message for the last three weeks of the campaign all i'm seeing at the moment are full page ads at least in sydney that are just bashing morrison and then if they run interest rates as their big piece that is not going to have the same effect as last time so while there may be a preference flow that's not the relevance of uap mm. it's where the wall of noise frames the final debate and there is nothing in my numbers to suggest that if the wall of noise frames the debate around interest rates that just leads everything everyone away from labor to to create another life raft for morrison i just can't mm. see it um, one thing I might just add to that is uh, it might spell the need for truth in political advertising laws because, indeed, it is the RBA that sets interest rates, not Clive Palmer. Um, and, you know, perhaps some of that um, misleading um, advertising could be avoided if there were truth in political advertising laws. Keep dreaming, like, keep dreaming, Eb, keep dreaming. Yeah, currently completely legal to lie in a political ad, folks. Um, 
The next question I've got is around the women's vote from Jan Pierce. Um, she wants to know about the influence of the women's vote on the election in general um, and anything that we've got on marginal and teal seats in particular. Uh, I probably don't think it's a, a coincidence that a lot of the teal independent candidates, if not all of them, are women. Uh, maybe Dave Pocock uh, for the Senate in Canberra being a, um, a standout from the crowd there. But Pete, um, what do we know about the women's vote this election? Well, up until this week's poll, and Sarah and I were talking about this last night, um, there's been a really strong gender split um, towards Labor and also a really strong um, gender differential on attitudes towards the Prime Minister. Although we did pick, and I'm still not sure if it's statistical noise or something more, that there was a shift back to women and Liberal votes in this week's poll. And if you go to essentialreport.com.au and go into the um, the primary vote and hit gender, you can see that. I'm not gonna to read too much into that at the moment. And we also didn't poll on leader ratings. Um, by and large, I do know that women are more likely to be undecided voters still, um, and that the issues that are bothering them are cost of living primarily more so than men. Um, so it feels like, and I hate, the cliches, house of household budget sort of politics. But remember, the vast majority of female voters are living non-political lives in suburbs and regional towns. Um, and so what does politics look for them? Very different than what it looks like on an Australia Institute webinar. Sarah, I was really interested with, I thought, um, a really strong um, emphasis on <coughs> women and women's issues from at the labour launch, whether it's aged care, primarily workers uh, in aged care are women, the focus on childcare, and then the pay equity <coughs> announcement, making that mm. an objective of fair work. I don't think that's an accident either. Um, was that the impression that you got that the Labor is overtly making a play for women voters this election? Oh, absolutely. And I think that also sort of ties into their um, pitch about wage growth. And obviously, those uh, female dominated industries are some of the lowest paid in the country. And, you know, I think that issue is actually goes beyond even the targeted workers. I think that sort of a, a, a most you know, reasonable people in society acknowledge that a lot of those um, care uh, workers are woefully underpaid. And the fact, I think most people are pretty um, shocked and unhappy about the fact that, you know, the, the, the person down at Bunnings is getting paid more than the person who's helping your elder, elderly relative in an aged care home. So um, I think that is certainly directed at um, female workers in those industries, but I think it also has broader appeal and it sort of appeals to that sense of a fair go and, and sort of ties into that um, broader conversation about um, wage growth and the need to, to lift wages in those industries. Yeah. Um, Pete, a couple of people commenting in here about the Greens and what's happening with the Greens vote. I know a couple of national polls have had them quite high, for example, in, in Queensland. Um, but would you just have a word of caution there? Because they're a smaller minor party fluctuations in vote, you know, uh, do people need to be wary of that? How are the Greens yeah, struggling? I, I saw that resolve poll with the Greens at 15%, which is kind of double what we've had most of the year. It feels they're still, you know, around 10, maybe as high as 12. Uh, obviously, a lot of the focus has been drawn away from the Greens um, towards the Teals because of their their scale and role in really strategic seats. Um I thought Adam Bant sort of saying it's great to have more people campaigning on these issues is exactly the right approach for the Greens to be taking on that. Um, the numbers, if they're, if they're 12 and rising, their chances of picking up seats in the Senate um, going forward rather than backwards is strong. Um, but I, I'm just not sure if it's as high as 15. Again, it feels like that. You don't let people say don't know, so they default to minor parties and independents. So, yeah. We'll know in a few weeks. It'll be really clear. <laughs> um, we've probably got time for a last couple of uh, questions here. Um, I've got one question here from Russell Johnston. Pete, this one might be for you about the influence of newly enrolled young voters. Uh, is there anything we know about young voters this election? We, we know there was a significant um, dump of, it seemed like organised registrations of young voters, you know, the enrolled to vote drives just before 
um, the AEC roles closed in like hundreds of thousands, not, not, not small numbers. We know the younger you are, the more likely you are to vote progressive rather than conservative. Um, so, and the more young people, I think, enrolled, um, and they tend to, you know, first elections tend to be not just all concentrated around unis and inner city, but living in the suburbs as well. I think it's, a, I think the, the, the two factors to watch is the voting patterns of young people and also the number of people that have moved from cities to the regions through the pandemic and whether that has any impact on the voting profiles of some of the, um, the rural um, seats, which have been traditionally just, you know, owned by the Nats. Um, Sarah, it strikes me that for young people, cost of living is also going to be a huge issue alongside climate change. We know young, young people tend to be more concerned about that. Yeah, I was going to mention housing specifically, um, both sides kind of trying to address it, but much more from the trying to buy your first house angle than anything around um, rental rights and things like that. Um, but you know, those would be huge issues for a lot of young people out there. Is mm -hmm. there any chance that we might see an announcement on rental rights or anything before the election? Or are we firmly just in protecting people's wealth if they own, own a house, do you reckon? Uh, look, I think very much the latter. I think, um, uh, and I think, I think both part, part leaders have been asked about this and have given no indication that there's going to be anything um, uh, special coming for, for rent, renters. Um, and even on the housing issue, uh, both parties have policies for housing sort of ac accessibility, but nothing that will really address affordability. And we know that um, attempts to do the things that will actually improve housing affordability like winding back some of the concessions um, for negative gearing and capital gains tax, um, some of those housing tax reforms that would make a substantial difference to affordability um, have been more or less dismissed out of hand by um, both parties, at least for now. Um, I mean, you think at some point in the future, um, they, they are going to have to look at them. But we know after um, Labor attempted to um, present some tweaks to the Australian people on both of those issues, um, they were absolutely hammered and were uh, you know were subsequently buried as labor policies um, and I guess the other issue that would really do something about housing affordability is sort of land supply and housing supply which um, is is primarily the responsibility of the states but it doesn't mean the federal government can't do anything I mean they can certainly put in place incentives to try and improve the um, supply side of the equation so um, in terms of those issues for young people um, and housing affordability and rental stress um, I think what we've seen so far is probably all we're going to get. Yeah. Um, worth mentioning to the Nordic Policy Centre at the Australia Institute put out a paper on housing affordability over the weekend and how other governments approach that problem. In Australia, we do tend to rely entirely on public, uh, a private ownership of houses and private rental markets and um, pointing out that the Nordic countries um, have a much greater proportion of uh, for example, uh, cooperative housing and uh, housing co-ops, both for owners um, as well as for renters, um, up to, I think, you know, a third of the housing market there is cooperatives in some countries. So there are different models out there. And perhaps if we can't touch tax reform, uh, we might see more interest in some of those um, other ideas and, and ways of doing things. Um, I think that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. I really want to thank Sarah Martin. You can find her on Twitter at Ms. Marto. Peter Lewis is at Peter Lewis EMC. Thank you so much for joining us today, both of you. You can find me at Ebony underscore Bennett. And thanks everyone for your great questions. I'm sorry, as always, that we couldn't get to all of them. Uh, we do this every fortnight and you can sign up for um, the next couple in a row. I think we've got one more before the election campaign is over, but we really enjoy these chats and we really appreciate all your questions out there. So thanks very much for joining us. Don't forget um, to head on over to Guardian Australia to find this recording as a podcast if you want to catch up with it for any reason and head on over to australiainstitute.tv for the video recording if you want to share it with anyone else. I uh, hope you can join us on Friday for the climate debate. And then next week, we'll be talking to Helen Haynes and Zali Stegall about the integrity election. So please tune in for those. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks, Sarah and Pete. And we'll see you all soon. Stay safe out there. We'll see you soon. Bye. Thanks.